All right, the floor is all yours. Okay, cool. Um, I will add the slides quickly to the doc so everyone can um, open the slides and see them at their own pace. Oh, looks like I can't edit the, the question document. So we'll just uh, post the slides in the chat here in Zoom. I just updated the permission so people can edit it now. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, then Let's get started. Um, so today we are here to, um, to talk about dust. I give you a, a quick uh, walkthrough. Uh, before we start, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me introduce myself, who I am, what I'm doing at GitLab. Um, I'm a security researcher. That means my job is to yeah, keep GitLab secure by, by finding vulnerabilities and uh, to get them patched. Um, what I also did is uh, I re-implemented GitLab's DAS tool. Uh, when I started at GitLab uh, about a year ago, we, we already had a DAS tool, but it was a fork from some other project. And um, we, yeah, it was not ideal because it was a fork and we couldn't easily upgrade to new Z versions and so on. So um, the re-implementation that I did um, used some other mechanism to extend SAP with the features that we want to add for GitLab. And um, yeah, so that's the re-implementation we are going to have a look uh, today in. Um, so my background um, is that uh, I did a PhD in automated security testing. So I, I spent a lot of time in looking at you know, how to devise clever testing techniques and uh, uh, solve, uh, solve academic problems like, you know, uh, detecting if a test case worked, something that's called an Oracle problem, designed a lot of empirical studies that compare uh, different dynamic uh, testing tools. Um, I'm not going too deep into this, um, but I'm, I'm linking the publications here that I did um, on Google Scholar feel free to check them out. And if you find anything interesting there, uh, we can chat about it. Um, so that's me. Um, what would be interesting to me is to hear a little bit about your background, especially what was your, or what is your experience with uh, DAST? Maybe we do a quick uh, round where everyone is saying one or two sentences. Yeah, so I'll start. Uh, so I'm fairly new to DAS and a lot of the automated security tools uh, from a development perspective, uh, but have used a lot of them at uh, some of my previous companies uh, just to run scans on some of the applications. We, we can just uh, keep doing the round. Thanks, Seth. Uh, uh, I'll go next. Um, I'm totally new to DAST and other automated security tools, and I'm really excited to learn about them. Awesome, thanks. Hi, I'm Lucas. Um, I've used tools, but nothing DAST related in the past. Um, my primary exposure in the past has been through receiving the results of reports and having to figure out exactly what's going on with the application. So um, switching over to this side at GitLab has been very educational. Uh, hey, I joined uh, GitLab last week, so I've, it's my first time using a DAS tool. I've used some static analysis tools before, but uh, yeah, this is the first time I'm using it so far. Like, uh, I ran DAS locally on my system, and and I've also used Zap Proxy, so I'm just like learning stuff right now. Hey, I'm I'm Adam. I'm a backend engineer on the secure team, um, and yeah, I have. Recently had experience with uh, SAST, but not with DAST. So this is all new to me. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Julian, um, and I have like some limited dust experience. I have used some tools in the past, um, um, but yeah, ne never for like, like industrial uh, scale, just for just for fun. So this will be also very interesting for me. Hi, I'm Paula. Similar to everyone, I'm an engineer. Not much experience with dust, um, other than setting it up and running what we have at GitLab. Uh, hi, I'm Ethan. Okay. Oh. Go ahead, Ethan. Okay. Hi, I'm Ethan. I'm actually an application security engineer. <laughs> so I have used a couple of different DAS tools, but I'm interested in learning more about how uh, GitLabs works. Hi, I'm Victor. Um, <clears throat> I'm from GitLab from the static analysis group. But uh, previously, I've been doing some work on Dest as a programmer, so I'm curious about the information security background behind the dynamic scanning in general and what is the direction for Dust, what new features are about to come. Awesome. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, did we miss someone? Well, I didn't uh, chime in, but uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and do it now. Um, I've, I've used uh, DAS tools at other companies, but never been responsible for a DAS tool. So uh, that's why I'm joining in. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. It's, it's really cool that we have so many people now uh, working on DAS. And I think with just that much uh, engineering power, we can really do something cool. Um, so yeah, I guess I can I can start then a little bit from the basics of Dust since uh, many people said they, they didn't have too much exposure um, on Dust before. So I will go through all the slides and um, yeah, if you have questions, just uh, interrupt me. Um, all right, yeah, <laughs> uh, GitLab uh, 12.2 now with 100% more Dust. Uh, it's just a funny slide, nothing uh, real to announce with GitLab 12.2, but I like the slide, so. <laughs> uh, what is DAST? Uh, DAST stands for Dynamic Application Security Testing. And um, the difference to, to other uh, test, uh, testing tools that we are having in GitLab is that it's actually executing the code of the application that we're going to test. Um, if you compare that with, for example, uh, static analysis with, with our ZAST tools, uh, ZAST looks at a source code. Um, and so it analyzes the source code and builds an abstract syntax tree and this kind of stuff, but it does not necessarily execute the code. What DAST is doing, it's, it's executing the code and by sending uh, test cases to the running application and observing the behavior to that uh, test case, the tool infers if there is some vulnerability in the tested application. Um, to give you a basic example, um, if, if we send a, an HTTP request um, that has some uh, SQL injection payload and then the, the server side application replies with, um, with a 500 something error that says you had an error in your SQL syntax, then you have a very good indication that um, a, there is some SQL injection uh, problem happening. So, uh, and to get to this knowledge, we don't need to look at the source code of the application, but we can infer it from the response that we got after sending a SQL injection payload. Um, the, the advantage of doing it that way is that DAST is language agnostic. Um, it can be applied to any web application, no matter with which uh, framework uh, it has been written. Um, yes, but uh, the, the way uh, we propose it to be used is uh, in combination with SAS, dependency scanning and so on, because of course DAST will not find all vulnerabilities. Um, that's why it's complementary to other approaches uh, like SAS and so on that can together give you good coverage of the vulnerabilities that might be in the source code. Um, 
a quick uh, overview how you actually can use Dast at uh, GitLab. Um, we have since GitLab 11.9 um, something that is called job template and that makes it really easy to to use Dast. Um, you just need to include this vendor template and um, then the, the pipeline will already run the Dast tests. Um, you can uh, I linked it to the documentation where you can read more about it. Um, it also supports additional variables that you can uh, specify, uh, which are then used to to start an authenticated scan. What that exactly means, um, I, I go into detail later on. And uh, if you set up Dust on your project, your pipeline might look something like this. Um, first, you you build your app, then you do your normal unit tests, SAS tests, dependency scanning, what so, what, and so on. And um, after that, you would spin up in review app. And once that is up, you can run Dust against um, that review app. So here you see again, Dust is running against a live application and based on the behavior of that application, it can tell you if there, there's vulnerabilities in the application. Um, if it found something, uh, you will you will see it in the merge request, uh, like depicted here on the screenshot. Oops, um, yep, like in the screenshot, like uh, it it complains about certain headers are missing here and uh, some other vulnerabilities. Uh, you can also click on each of these findings and it will open a model dialog where it will tell you what was the exact page um, where it found this, um, this find. So uh, this is how it looks from the user perspective, but um, uh, most of you are engineers and uh, we, we want to dive a little bit deeper on uh, what Dust is actually under the hood. Um, so Dust uh, is built on OWASP ZAP which is, um, uh, let, let me maybe say a couple of words to Zap. Zap is a proxy that is used a lot with semi-automated security testing. Basically what you do is uh, you proxy the requests that you do from a browser through Zap and um, Zap shows you exactly what is going over the wire on an HTTP level. And that is very useful to play around with different parameters, to see how the application reacts when you send certain parameters that you might not be able to set via the UI. Um, other than that, Zap also has an automated mode where you can just point Zap to a certain URL and uh, then Zap will start to, um, to test that application that is found at that URL. Uh, and exactly this behavior is what we leverage in, in GitLab. Um, so yeah, Zap is uh, applicable to, to web application, to web applications. Um, that means HTML and JavaScript and, and all that stuff. Um, the repository is, uh, I linked it there. I guess most of you already are aware of that. And um, it's implemented the part that we implemented is uh, mostly written in Python and also some shell script. And uh, our Dart image is basically shipped as a Docker container. Uh, Zap itself is uh, mostly written in Java and also has some uh, Python scripts, especially for the automated scanning that I mentioned, where you can just point it to a URL and it will do some automated tests. These are Python scripts. That's also why our code is written in Python. <clears throat> um, maybe I, I make a quick question, a, a short pause to see if there are any questions already. Are, are there many functional differences between the OWASP um, GUI tool and what is possible through the, uh, the CLI? Um, so, I'm not aware of too many differences, at least not for our use case, uh, because um, OWASP Zap has an, has an API that we can use. 
this is this is also how how our um, testing tools interact with Zap. Um, so most of the things you can do via the UI, you can also call directly uh, via the API. Okay. Might be that might be that there are some things that are not possible via the API, but I haven't run into these yet. Great, thank you. All right, um, then let's move on. Um, the, the most significant features that we have added to Zap um, are so far uh, support for authenticated scans. And uh, we also report now a little bit more details on what the crawler found while it was running. Uh, let me explain you a little bit more on these two features. Um, why do we need authenticated scans? Um, most of the, the application, web applications are typically uh, only accessible if, if you are signed in, right? If you are authenticated. Think about GitLab. If you are not authenticated, you only get to see about.gitlab.com. Once you sign in, you can have access to much more. So in order to test everything that is behind uh, authentication, um, Zap needs to be able to authenticate. And um, the basic uh, Zap scripts didn't have any support for authentication. So this is what we added as a feature. Um, the way that works is you specify a command line parameter or environment variables um, that tell Zap which username and password to use. And then um, our Python scripts will use uh, Selenium uh, and, and Firefox web driver to, um, to actually request a sign-in page to fill in username and password to submit this. And um, it will pass the session cookie then that is returned from the application. And every uh, following call will add the session cookie. That means um, that all the, the dask scan is basically running in an authenticated context from then on. Um, and then the, the second part with the crawler is, um, I haven't yet explained what uh, crawling actually is, but uh, I come to that later. Um, in the, the basic, the basic OWASP uh, ZAP um, scan does not say very much about what were the URLs it actually tested. It just reports the URLs where it found something. And the problem here is that you don't know what was the coverage of your scan. You know, due to several reasons, it might have not scanned everything. And as a user, you want to know about that. That's why we added um, this, features, this feature where it actually tells you what URLs it scanned. For both features, I, I was linking some relevant code and, and issues where you can read up more. Um, oh yeah, this is an example how it looks when um, when when Zap is reporting the URLs it actually scanned. So um, the the crawler here is called Spider. Um, it, it tells you things like progress one hundred. Uh, it is important because the the crawler might not actually able to finish in time because he he has been running into a timeout and uh, and. If that's the case, then the coverage of your application won't be 100%. And we want users to, to know this. If it, run, uh, if it was running in a timeout, it would also not say finished here, but will say something else. Um, and then uh, under results, you actually see what were the URLs it found. Um, the ones that were out of scope, um, untested. So while the crawler is uh, searching for links, it will it will find links that are pointing outside of the application that we want to test, and these links are not going to be uh, to to be tested. Um, only the links that are in scope are actually being saved for the for the actual tests. And the the links that are in scope here, for example, are under URLs in scope and um, everything that is essentially under GOAT um, colon 8080 will be saved for later testing. Dennis, um, real quick, is the yeah. scope defined by the review app URL that you put in the pipeline? Uh, not directly. There is an, a command line parameter um, that you should set to the, to the review app. But there's still okay. some configuration that you do. 
So in a way, yes, the, the in scope will be defined by the, the review app URL, but you need to tell us what is the review app. Oh, okay. Now, Dennis, can you <clears throat> tell uh, quickly a bit more about scopes? Uh, what are those for uh, how we can increase the benefits of death scanning by leveraging scopes? <clears throat> um, yeah, so scope, uh, in, in the basic form, uh, scope keeps basically the, the test focused on um, the target. Um, what that means to really understand is um, maybe I explain first how crawling works and then we, we come back to the question of uh, how why scopes are important. Okay. <clears throat> That's actually the next slide. So let me quickly say what, what crawling is and then we come back to how uh, scopes work with that. Um, so right now Dust essentially works in two phases, the discovery phase, that's the crawling or spidering. And then the second phase is the actual testing phase. Um, the crawler works by, um, you give it an, an URL from where it starts crawling. And starting from that URL, it will follow all the, the links it can find. So it will request that, that initial URL passes all the, the links it can find or uh, references to, to JavaScript sources, to CSS sources, everything that somehow looks like an URL, it will extract and then it will follow these links. Um, if you're wondering what is this starting URL, this is exactly the parameter Dust website that we can specify uh, for Dust run, which is also what Ethan was just uh, mentioning before, um, the, the the URL that we, we point to. Um, yeah, so it starts basically crawling from the start page and recursively it will go into all the URLs it finds. Um, it, for all the pages it finds, it stores them and it also looks for potential input parameters. Like uh, think of it, if it's, an, if it's a form that can be submitted, it will remember which parameters are on that form or if it, uh, if it requested the page via a get, it will also uh, remember what were the parameters on the get request and so on. This is going to be important because these are the parameters that are later on being tested. Um, and then finally, the dust run is going to run either until it uh, runs into a timeout or um, until it's finished. This ties back into what I told you before earlier about the progress here and state finished. Uh, if it runs in the timeout, it won't be at 100% uh, here. Um, by default, our baseline scan is just scrolling, uh, crawling for, for one minute. Um, everything more than that would be timeout. Um, and the active scan doesn't have any timeout set. So that also means on the other hand that for very large applications, the crawler might run for a very long time. Um, now that we talked a little bit about crawling, um, we can go back to Victor's questions about scopes. So how, how are scopes important? Basically we set a scope of the crawling to that of our um, DAS target application. Um, what that means is if there are links on, on our page that point outside of our target application, like what we see here in that array URLs out of scope. Here we are testing code column 8080 and on that page it found, for example, a link to getbootstrap.com. Uh, what that means is it would not actually follow that link. It, it's not requesting getbootstrap.com or even sending malicious test cases to, to anything out of scope. Um, so with that, with scopes, we can essentially focus testing on our own application and not on all the internet. So scopes are a sets of URLs to scan. Maybe there are some patterns like wildcards or something like that. Uh, how, how can we define scopes when we are running test? Um, so yeah, you're right. Basically scopes can have wildcards um, and so you can, if I remember correctly, you can say 
what scopes to include and also if you want to exclude certain subparts of your application, right? You might only want to scan a certain path but not other paths within your application. This should also be possible to be set via the API. Um, but uh, I haven't done it yet, but I think that API call exists. Um, does this somewhat answer your question or is there? Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Victor, I don't know if this is one of the reasons you're asking, but it's particularly relevant. One of the things that we want to do in a future release is to have multiple URLs. So you could have URL1.com, URL2.com as a single scan. Um, so I think the scope might be the area if we pass in those URLs as a scope, as a JSON or whatever format it takes uh, to kick off the scan. Yeah, I guess we have to do some exploration here. I wonder if it, if it would be easier to kick off different task jobs here or if we want to do it in one job. I don't know, maybe it's something to, to investigate on. Thanks. All right, so um, we have been talking about uh, crawling. This is the first phase. This is basically the discovery phase where, where our tool finds out what are all the, the pages and what are the pot potential parameters via which we can pass malicious inputs. And um, the actual testing phase where Zap is discovering vulnerabilities is the second phase. Um, how this exactly works depends on the scan mode. Um, if we use the, the passive scan mode, uh, what it will do is it will just look at um, the pages that have been uh, stored during the crawling. So all the HTTP communication during the crawling phase is recorded and uh, in a passive scan it just um, looks over these HTTP messages to see if there are some vulnerabilities. Things that you can identify by doing this is for example um, you can check if um, form submissions so post requests have a uh, CSF token. If they don't have a CSF token, that typically means there's vulnerability. Um, or you can also highlight other things like missing CSP headers and these kinds of things that you can just infer by observing how normal requests look like. And then the, the other test mode that we're having is um, an active scan or um, also what it's referred to full scan in the documentation. Um, what the full scan does is it's doing the, the thing that the passive scanner is doing, just looking through the recorded legitimate uh, requests. And in addition to that, it will take all the pages and all the parameters that have been identified and it will submit some uh, malicious uh, test cases. Uh, so you can think of this like uh, sending a SQL injection payload, like uh, apostrophe, drop table, whatever, right? Um, and based on how the application responds, um, it, it can uh, infer if there is a vulnerability in the application. Dennis, so those malicious um, submissions, are those based on the type of application? So it sees a PHP app and it knows PHP is vulnerable to a particular type of, uh, you know, payload versus a Ruby or some other application, or are they generic across the board? Uh, there are many generics in there, but uh, some have definitely been inspired by common uh, problems that are around in, in PHP or other applications. Um, but yeah, it, it's not too tight to specific uh, frameworks. And then are those, uh, those rules or those uh, tests, are those built into Zap or is that a separate database that Zap downloads? Um, um, these are actually implemented um, as a kind of add-on system. So they, they are not tied directly into Zap and probably it would be even in, uh, possible to develop our own test heuristics and add them uh, via add-ons. That's actually something that is, is pretty cool to, for myself because uh, I'm looking for vulnerabilities and based on the knowledge that we uh, get in AppSec, uh, it would be cool to add some additional tests to Zap that can look for the vulnerabilities that we found. 
Great, thanks. That sounds like a cool way to add, do value add for this particular product. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. One thing that we have seen a lot and uh, Zap doesn't have tests for is, for example, uh, server side request forgeries. Uh, might be cool if we, based on all the experience, uh, Ethan, you and I have gathered on this topic, if we, if we put together an add-on. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, next slide. Uh, I just mentioned a couple of challenges from the top of my head that I see with these two testing phases. Um, regarding the first phase, the discovery phase, uh, some problems we have been running into is um, insufficient support for different web technologies, like for example, JavaScript. Um, uh, I mentioned that the crawler is actually fetching pages and is parsing the content. Um, what the default crawler does is it only parses HTML content. Now, what happens in JavaScript heavy applications is that a lot of the links are only loaded um, when JavaScript is executed. So um, our, our crawler will only find them if it's executing JavaScript. And this is uh, for Dust only the case if you pass in a certain parameter. But that's not a default set. Um, and then I also found an issue which is somewhat annoying where it starts crawling not at a URL that you specified at, at the entry URL, but it will always start crawling at the root URL. And this leads sometimes to problems if your uh, application does not serve content on the root URL, then the, the, the JavaScript crawler won't find anything. I've laid the related issue here um, and uh, yeah, we should look into that. Um, another thing that is giving me really headache is um, that the crawler seems to be losing the authenticated context. Um, I mentioned that one of the big features that we add to Zap is that it actually, it's logging into the application and it's, it's discovering the application under a certain user context. Um, what seems to be happening is that um, at some point it might hit the lockout URL, at which point the session it's using is invalidated. And from that point onward, all the crawling will just hit the parts of the application that you can see from an unauthenticated view. So probably this leads to a lot less coverage to what we could have. Um, I also linked an, an issue here on this point. For me personally, this is the, the top most priority issue that uh, we need to look into. Um, and then the, the last point that I was mentioning here is that crawling can really take a long time since it's following all the links it can find. And if you, if you run the crawler in an, an exhaustive fashion where you don't set a timeout, that can be for a long time. Like, we run it this way in, uh, for, for the full scan, and the full scan can take, a several, can take up to a couple of hours. The crawling adds to that, uh, but also the, the fact that we are sending malicious test cases. Uh, I come a couple of slides back to why the runtime is so long, but um, uh, then, I see, yeah? Uh, does the crawler utilize sitemap? It use, utilizes what? Uh, the sitemap.xml file. Ah, um, it's a good question. Um, I've seen that it actually requested that file. It, it looks for a couple of um, standard files like uh, robots.txt and sitemap XML. Um, and I think it would extract URLs that it's finding there, um, but I haven't uh, tried it out specifically. But I would be surprised if it doesn't. Uh, could there be a feature uh, uh, inside the sitemap XML file where we can specify which URLs are authenticated and which are not? And if the crawler reaches an uh let's say a URL which logs out, can the crawler be modified to re-log in and set the cookie? Yes, that, that's a very good point. Um, so um, I think ultimately how how the how this authentication logic should work is. Um, 
first we create an authenticated session and uh, the crawler should be somewhat aware of if the current page that he requested uh, was done in authenticated context. Uh, the way you could do that, for example, typically there is some HTML that is giving away the fact that the page was served in an authenticated context. For example, for gitlab.com, if I'm logged in, in the top right corner, there's a little picture of me and it says signed in as uh, the adult. So we could add this information um, to, to Dust and tell it, tell it if this uh, pattern is not in the response, you have lost your authenticated context, please log in again. I think this should be like the, the, um, the ultimate solution uh, that we're having. Uh, the easier solution right now would be if we just enforce that URLs that we already told us not to crawl, not to hit, and then as a follow-up, we should teach it how to re-authenticate in case it's losing authentication. Uh, so the crawler code base is part of the proxy or it's a different uh, third party tool which zap is a dependent, uh, which is a dependent dependency of zap um the basic crawler the one that is just doing html uh, is part of zap if i remember correctly um but the one that is doing javascript um is called crawl jacks and that's that's a other open source dependency So, uh, yeah, I, I think that to come back to your question with a, with a sitemap, site map, I think we should not uh, require to modify uh, sitemap XML, but to, to give us some other way of knowing if it's logged in. Okay. But it goes in the right direction, your, your idea. Um, okay. Um, giving you a brief overview over the two complementary scan modes that we have. I already explained a little bit along the line. We have uh, baseline scans and we have active scans. Um, a baseline scan typically takes around five minutes um, because crawling is limited to one minute. Um, you can increase this. Uh, this is just a default value, but if you don't overwrite the default value, it's limited at one minute and then it will do the passive test just based on the traffic that the, the crawler was seeing. Um, and the baseline scan, because it's not running that long, it's suitable to be uh, run in time sensitive CI pipelines. Uh, you can imagine that uh, if you run a long running DAS test in a pipeline, your developers are going to complain that, uh, you know, they want to merge their code and why does DAS take again two hours just for one little commit? So we need to be aware that time is very, is very critical when we run in the context of CI pipelines. Um, yeah, a lot of these other points that I, that I list on the baseline scan I already mentioned. Um, and um, in comparison to that, the, the active scan, as I already said, takes a longer time because there's no limit for the crawler and for all the parameters it identified, it actually sends uh, HTTP requests with malicious payloads. Um, so the, where I see uh, active scans um, applicable is more in, in a scheduled pipeline that is not uh, run for every commit that you're pushing, but you run it, for example, nightly or in 12 hour intervals or something like that. <clears throat> So we, we've recently been talking about um, strategies of running incremental scans for uh, static analysis. And um, I'm curious, do you see any, uh, any uh, strategy for um, moving DAS close to incremental scans? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I think, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, and um, I'm talking about this a little bit at, at one of the last slides where I say future vision. Um, if we could add incremental scans for DAS, that would be awesome. And I think that also would help a lot uh, with cutting down the, the runtime and with focusing uh, the time we're spending with DAS to really test the, the changes that have been introduced by a recent commit. So that would be an awesome feature. 
And uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, other dust tools that are out there, um, they, they don't really do that very well, if at all. Um, so other DAS tools out there might be better at, you know, coming up with testing for various vulnerabilities and so on. But in the context of CI, CD, I think we have a chance here to, to uh, do what you were saying and to actually make DAS useful in the CI, CD context by doing incremental scans and focusing on uh, introduced uh, functionality. All right, uh, if there are no follow-up questions, I move on to actually explaining why dust scans take so long. <laughs> um, and just a quick time check, we've got about 20 minutes left. Okay, cool. Uh, let me see, I have three more slides coming up. Uh, so I hurry up and then we can open it up for questions. Um, Basically, why does it take so long? Essentially, you can approximate the, the time an active scan takes by uh, the number of pages it has found, uh, times the average number of parameters per page, times the number of test cases it's executing. And uh, that will give you the total execution time. Um, and for each of these, uh, so for this number, it will have to do an HTTP request for each test case, right? An HTTP request has a certain overhead needs to open TCP connection and so on. So this will take roughly about 10 milliseconds. And um, so the, the number of total test cases that it's executing is easily thousands or 10,000s. That's why it quickly adds up to um, a couple of hours. Um, yes, so Right now, we only test uh, applications, but we also have an issue where we talk about adding support for testing APIs, REST SOAP APIs. You can have a look at the I link the issue. And um, the last slide here is my personal future vision where I could see we could, we could add great value to Dust. So the first one is related to what uh, Lucas was mentioning, um, which is incremental scans. Um, right now, how it works is on every commit, we crawl the entire site over and over again. So we start again from the entry URL and we try to discover the entire site structure. Um, I think we could save a lot of time if, if we would be a little bit smart on what to scan and do, do some kind of incremental scan. Only scan the part of the application that has been affected by the change in the commit. Um, so for that, we would need to, to infer what has been affected by, by a commit. And we also would need to persist state between dust runs and to, to pass it from one uh, run to the other one. And another area where I see we could do really big improvements for dust is um, with the user experience once we actually present a list of findings Right now, it's, it's just a list of findings that is pointing you to the URL of the review app with uh, whatever it found. Um, that's not a very nice uh, experience because as a security analyst, what I would want to do is I want to confirm if that finding is a, is a true positive. For that, I need to reproduce it. And uh, there would be much nicer ways of enabling the security analyst to reproduce a finding. Um, I will write this point up in more detail in an issue and um, then it might get more clearer. Um, I won't spend more time on this now because I will to open up to your questions. So who wants to go first? Um, I just wanted to know about the speed uh, of scanning. You said it takes quite a few hours. Is it possible to paralyze uh, the process to increase the speed? Um, I think it is already paralyzed. So the, the crawler for sure is paralyzed. It's using uh, paralyzed in the sense that it's using several threads. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe that could be optimized. Uh, maybe there's a bottleneck because there are, I don't know. I haven't looked yet into that. Possible that it can be um, increased by, yeah. <laughs> but it's running from a single machine? It's running from a single machine, yeah, from a single Docker image. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so it might pos be possible to scale it out to multiple machines and coordinate it, or maybe the coordination would take too long. I think that should be possible. Um, of course, that comes with quite some engineering effort. Right. Uh, it's, it's a question if we want to do that, or if that engineering effort is maybe better spent in looking into incremental scans. That's something that is up for the team to decide. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yeah, it I, looks I like. Have, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I just I'm curious about uh, the crawler. I just wanted to ask, how does the crawler avoid cycles? Um, is it just that whenever he goes back to the same URL, he won't like crawl the same page again? And and related to that, if you have like second order vulnerabilities uh, in your application. Basically, this implies that uh, a crawler that don't visit the same page cannot detect these kind of vulnerabilities, I suppose. Uh, yeah, that's, these are all very good questions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first question, uh, cycle detection. Um, it has some logic to detect loops based on uh, if it has seen an URL before. But then, of course, you know, uh, the, the same content can be um, served under dynamic uh, site passes, right? So it would keep s requesting new URLs, but keeps getting the same content. Uh, so in theory, I think it's possible that it runs into uh, loops, but uh, I haven't seen that yet much. Um, but we, we should uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then the other question that you brought up was with second order vulnerabilities. So um, just a little bit of background on second order vulnerabilities. What it means is basically that first you need to, you, you need to submit the payload at one part of the application, and, um, but it's not directly executed. Uh, you need to uh, request a, a different part of the application to actually get the payload that you have placed on, on the first request executed. This is a second order vulnerability. Um, and I don't think Zap has any test heuristics to detect second order vulnerabilities. So yeah, that's I guess the, the simple answer. <laughs> um, Dennis, one of the questions in um, the dashed architecture migration issue was um, related to ZA proxy being called directly, which I guess was in earlier versions of GitLab. Uh, can you just give a, a quick overview as to it, why it was called directly and then the, the benefit of moving it over into a DAST wrapper? Um, so at first it was called directly because um, it, we were forking the project and we were um, editing the, the source file so we were directly calling our modified source file um, when i re-implemented um, dust um, my goal was to do it in a non-breaking fashion that means i i kept calling the the same uh, source file but this time we were modifying the source file so if you look at um, the docker file in the dust project you will see that it's moving some files around and this is because um, we want to keep the, the file it's calling uh, by the same name to avoid breaking change. But this is all historical reasons. So, so the implementation today uses the full upstream ZAP project and then we supplement it with, with our own files? It's using the full upstream project, yeah. And um, it's, it's using two ways to extend the, the upstream project. One way is, um, we, we have a, a wrapper script around the upstream project. Uh, for example, the different scan modes that we are providing, uh, they have different entry scripts in Zap. So uh, based on whatever scan mode we want to run, we call different entry script. And we also do some things like checking that that application is uh, already has started, right? This curl check where, where uh, the team has been working on the last couple of days. Um, 
And then the second way of extending Zap's functionality are so-called hook scripts. Um, Zap allows you to, to define custom logic and at certain points of the application, uh, of, the, of the execution of the scan nodes, it will call out to functions that can be defined by us. And uh, we use this, for example, to generate um, the test report containing the URLs and we use this to, to create authentic, an authenticated scan context. This is all done in the hook scripts. And I think that's a very nice solution because it allows us to not modify the upstream project. I have a question about uh, mitigating the issues related to JavaScript. Uh, so uh, have you considered uh, moving away from Zap? or maybe building some kind of scaffolding on our side, on GitLab side, uh, to be able to swap uh, the scanners, the scanning tools under this uh, scaffolding, under this common interface to the DEST uh, scanning tools, to uh, try leveraging some more JS-friendly scanning tools than Zap. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, Philippe has looked into a couple of uh alternative solutions. And uh, I think ultimately we want to support uh, uh, different uh, tools. I don't know if I can mention names here, if this is public or, or not. So <laughs> I guess we all know the, the issues that, that I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, I guess, um, does Zap just not have good support for JavaScript and that's not something that uh, would be uh, likely to come in, in the Zap tool? Uh, it does have support for JavaScript. It, it's using the, the Scrolljax um, project to do the JavaScript crawling. Mm -hmm. um, and this basically also works, but uh, there's this one problem that I identified where the, the crawling doesn't start at a, at a correct entry URL. Once we fix that, uh, we might want to reevaluate re if the crawler is finding then uh, more um, URLs. I think it should because I was using the, the desktop version where I could use the uh, JavaScript crawler and I could make it crawl at a different entry URL and then it was finding a lot of URLs that it didn't find in, um, in our last image. So are there any other questions in the doc that I haven't um, addressed yet? So there's one uh, remark here in the, in the document that says the variables in the Dust GitLab uh, CI YAML file refer to Dust username, Dust password. Where are those consumed in the project? Do they work and is there a project that tests them? Um, that's actually a good point. Um, I, they might be actually, um, that might be actually wrong in the documentation and, um, the environment variables that we expect in the, in the image are different from what is uh, specified in the docs. Yeah. What I found in the source code is, um, the timeout and the full scan and the website environment variables are used. Uh, I believe in, in the analyze script, um, but the DAST username, DAST uh, password, I couldn't find any reference to those in, um, in the analyze or in the Python scripts. Uh, you can pass them in as, as, as long parameters, but uh, it won't pull the environment variables, at least from what I saw in the source code. Yeah, that's a very good point. We, we probably should fix that. I'm, I was using this most, uh, mostly locally with uh, CLI params, mm -hmm. so that's probably why I've missed that one. And we, of course, we should also add tests as you're mentioning there. Yep. Okay, I think um, all of the questions in the docs uh, are addressed. Um, are there any other questions that you have in mind? I just had one follow up and it's a big one, so you can just, you know, limit it, but like, I guess, could you speak shortly on the limitations of DAST, like what sort of things you can't find? And then of those, are there ways that we can help improve 
the product that we can contribute so that it differentiates our product from other DAS scanners? Yeah, good point. Um, so Julian was already mentioning uh, stored vulnerabilities. I don't think uh, Zap has support for, for finding stored vulnerabilities. Uh, we were talking about earlier about server-side request forgery vulnerabilities. Um, that would be really nice if we could add some testing capabilities here. Alternative tools like Burp Suite, I think they, they have some uh, add-ons where you can test for that. So if we would uh, plug in for that, at least we had feature uh, parity with, uh, with Burp Suite here. Um, especially since SSF now gets a lot of attention and um, they might even include it in the Overwatch top 10. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think the, the AppSec team can, can give good input here because they have a uh, good understanding of what are very common uh, or trendy vulnerabilities right now. And uh, based on this, we could uh, develop add-ons for Zap that test for these kind of vulnerabilities. One interesting one I saw that Jeremy is using is like a thing that will scan with two different accounts and then compare the pages that it can access and will give you some idea of like permissions models and stuff like oh, that. That's awesome. Yeah. Was this something for Zap or is that Web Suite? No, it, well, it wasn't for, it was a separate, like third, a tool specifically generated for this. So it would be like something we would have to build out, but. Oh, okay. It, it's yeah. just sort of, it would be a cool idea that if we were going to work on extending functionality. Absolutely. Yeah. T testing uh, permission models is really hard. And you can also, yeah. based on GitLab, on the reports that we are getting, you can see, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's difficult, <laughs> difficult to get right. Uh, I think if we do something like this, maybe we do it outside of um, the current task tool. Oh, okay. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, um, I would say uh, we are at time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to working with you and to uh, to focus a bit more on adding advanced test, testing uh, heuristics like Ethan was just mentioning. Um, yeah, but if you have any questions regarding what, what I've been done uh, doing in the past, just uh, let me know. Okay, with that, uh, I'm, I guess we can stop sharing and stop recording. Well, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, really guys. appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.